Hey guys, we're back again for chapter four. Yesterday we met Nikki's new friend Aaron, who has a kind of a weird family, and then they snuck out to see something that Aaron wants to show Nikki. We don't know what it is yet. So let's dive right in. Here I'll show you the chapter art for chapter four. Very cool. All right. The factory should be fenced off. Maybe it was at some point, but it sure isn't now. And we shouldn't be able to walk right through the front door, but we do. I used to love golden apples, Aaron says, and his eyes get all dreamy. I wait for an explanation, but all I get is a look of shock. You've never had golden apples? I'm going to need you to stop saying golden apples, I say. It sounds like something my grandma would make me eat. I shake a crooked finger at him and try on my best old granny voice. Eat your golden apples so you grow up big and strong, dearie. These wouldn't make anyone big or strong. They were candy, Aaron says. I don't know what they put in those things, but I wouldn't sleep for days after I ate one. Guess that explains why they stopped making them, I say, but Aaron doesn't respond. He just looks away. The old golden apple factory doesn't look like much. I mean, it's an abandoned factory in the middle of the woods that miraculously we only seem to know about, so that's pretty cool. But besides the still operational conveyor belt and overall creepy atmosphere that comes from any abandoned place, I can't figure out why Aaron was so stoked to show me the factory. It's virtually empty, and I'm starving. Plus, my parents would have been so happy that I made a friend, they probably would have fallen all over themselves to feed us. Dad would have busted out the Susie cues for sure. Maybe Aaron just wanted to get out of his house. I know I did, away from his dad, at least. Come on, Aaron says, waving me up a ramp towards the back door with an unlit exit side over it. It's not an exit, though. Instead, the door leads to a hallway filled with more doors to the left and to the right, each with at least two locks bolting them shut. A lockpick's dream. Whoa, I breathe, and Aaron nods. Each one leads to another door, too, he says, all locked. I stare at the corridor like we've uncovered a secret stash of golden apples. I've only made it through half of them. They've all got different brands of latches and padlocks. Here, I'll show you my favorite room. Aaron beckons me to the middle of the corridor and fishes his tools from his pocket. Like me, he always carries his case. I hardly know what my pocket feels like anymore without it. With his signature smoothness, he springs the first lock easily, a simple lever handle and lock with a clutch. The door opens to a musty-smelling office, its furniture still haunting the room, waiting for its occupant to return. It's windowless and the light switch doesn't work. None of them work, Aaron says. I think the conveyor belt runs on an old generator or something. In answer to our need, Aaron scoops up a heavy flashlight from the top of a nearby filing cabinet. Found this baby on the first day, he says, illuminating his face from under his chin, like he's about to tell me a ghost story. Then he twitches his eyebrows up and down. Follow me. I hear a scurrying against the wall, and I know it's rats. I mean, it was a candy factory. I just pay, pray to the giant aliens they keep to the walls and the vents. What? Aaron asks, his voice taunting. His, his voice taunting. You got a thing about rats? I have a thing about rabies, I say. Hold this, Aaron says, handing me the flashlight. Then he fishes, fishes out a hook pick and leans his ear against the door. This is when I know Aaron is really at work. It's like he's listening to the door's heartbeat. I don't even bother asking why he locks the doors after he sprung them open. It's because each time is like the first time and there's no feeling like that. With the tiniest flick of the wrist, the pin clinks and the door groans open. Inside is a treasure trove of broken machinery. I had a feeling you'd want to see this, he says, and I hardly know what to say. There's this cartoon that I used to watch, okay, that I maybe possibly still watch with a ridiculously rich duck. He has so much money that he keeps all his gold and jewels and coins and bills piled in a room-sized vault and he swims through the treasure like it's water. That's what I wanted to do when Aaron opened this door. 
The secret office behind the regular office was probably considered a junk room, a kind of elephant's graveyard where electronics journeyed to eventually die as new hardware was invented to replace them. Maybe the tech guy at the Golden Apple Corporation found out he could make a buck selling these old monitors or keyboards or security cameras for parts. But the factory shut down and the already useless machines slept behind a locked door, guarded by an empty chair and another locked door. Dude, say something so I know you're not having a stroke or something. You smell like rat poop, I say, because it's the only way I can tell him no one has ever trusted me with treasure. Yeah, you're going to want to scrape your shoes before you get home, he says. And I think he understands that thank you would be embarrassing. I take what I can carry. The motor from an old vacuum, a fan from a CPU, a keyboard, and about five extension cords. I'll bring a bag next time, I said, say to Aaron, but he's already walking ahead of me, out the hallway and back onto the factory floor. He locks the door behind him so no one else can get in easily and vandalize our secret place. Before I know it, we're tromping all over the wooded path that leads into the woods and away from the train tracks. Then he pauses and I turn to see what he's staring at. There, just over the tree line, is a red and gold seat, rocking and creaking on a mild breeze, attached to the top of a large metal arc. Is that a Ferris wheel? I ask, already pushing past Aaron to cut a path through the overgrowth. I'm expecting to find a clearing full of other confectioner color rides and ticket booths. One of the millions of county fairs that pop up on Main Streets or in open parking lots during the summer months. But what I find instead is a ghost town. The Ferris wheels are paralyzed, moved only by the warm breeze that blows by. The wheel itself is covered in so much graffiti I can't even tell what color it used to be. And not the cool kind of graffiti that's left by daredevil street artists, the ugly kind of graffiti that's meant to erase whatever is underneath. I see the opening to a fun house that looks more horror than fun with its apple-shaped head and its wide mouth with bared teeth. I see a charred concession stand that's missing its roof and a collapsed stage still encircled by tiered cement seats. There's a carousel of vandalized animals prancing around a motionless grate. There's the top curve of a roller coaster track cresting above the tree line, a lone car perched on the apex. There used to be more, lots more. A directory obscured in oily burn residue tells me at least that much. But whatever this place was, it's dead and buried now. Across the concession stand, in faded white letters over red paint, reads Golden Apple Amusement Park. They made a park too? I ask, incredulous that Aaron didn't show me this just as eagerly as the factory. Sure, there were no locks or machines, but there's plenty to mess around with between the Ferris wheel and the roller coaster. I mean, the cars have to be around here somewhere. I bet I could get that carousel going again, I say, stacking my factory treasures against a tree and racing across the overgrown park. I emerge from the brush to find him looking at the ground, his hands crossed over his chest. He's acting like he's mad at me. What's the matter? Nothing. I just don't like it here, he says evasively. Are you joking? What's not to like? Seriously, why is this place, like, completely hidden? It's not hidden, Aaron says, but he almost spits it out like he's disgusted with me. Okay. I say, clearly terrible at sidestepping whatever landmine is buried beneath all this ash. Ash? Like, maybe it burned down? Did something happen here? I ask, and Aaron looks up. His eyes look like they're ready to shoot lasers, and I'm close enough that I think he might actually throw a punch at me, but I still have no idea why. There's a map of the uh, amusement park here. See that? It's a pretty cool amusement park. I wonder why Aaron doesn't like it so much. Then he seems to catch himself and his shoulders relax a little. I shouldn't have come this way. I forgot this was here. But I don't think that's true. I think maybe he wanted me to see it. So did it, like, burn down or something? I prod. Aaron just stares at me. I live down the street from a house that burned down once, I say, starting to ramble. It was a space heater or something, and everyone got out okay, but the place was completely torched. Just like this place. 
looks. I keep waiting for Aaron to say something to save me from my babbling, but he just keeps on staring. The sudden silence is a stark contrast from the factory only moments ago. Just when I think I'm going to suffocate under all the awkwardness, Aaron shakes his head. Let's get out of here, he says, and even though I'm relieved to go, I know I've let Aaron down somehow. He doesn't say a word the rest of the way home, just a casual, see you around, before he steps onto his unlit porch and disappears into the house. I replay the night in my head. The house with all its twists and turns, his dad's unique sense of humor, the factory, the amusement park. I try to figure out when things turned weird. Aaron was squirmy after we left his house, but that seemed to wear off once he showed me the factory. It was only after we got to the burnt remains of the amusement park that Aaron's entire demeanor changed. The guy who shared his trove of abandoned electronics had disappeared, and the angry, scared kid he left in his place needed me to know something. What were you trying to tell me, you weirdo? I asked Aaron's dark porch, because I know what it's like to want someone to guess how you're feeling. It's way easier than saying it. I set my electronics hall beside the door and decide I'll leave it there until the morning. Maybe by then I'll have a plausible explanation from where they came from. I barely have time to close the front door before mom and dad pounce on me. Did you have fun? What's he like? Are you guys in the same grade? Have you had dinner yet? Yeah, he's okay. Same grade, I say. Then I shrug. I'm not hungry. Mom, Mom's palm cups my forehead. Are you coming down with something? I just don't feel like eating, okay? Mom and dad exchange a look. He looks like our son, dad says, but he reaches for my face, tilting my chin up, tilting my chin to see up my nose, pinching my cheeks to open my mouth. I don't know, Lou, he could be a changeling. Hardy har har, I say, swatting dad's hand away. Well, you have two choices, mom says. You can stay here and eat like a normal 12 year old, or you can run a boring errand with your boring mother. I hadn't noticed before that she's wearing a rain jacket and shoes. I need a book from my office, she says. A book from her office at the university. Your office is near campus library, right? Mom cocks her head to the side. Just a science library? But does it have newspapers, like old records? Mom looks like she wants to ask another question, then loses interest. Probably, she says, grabbing her car keys. Our shoes squeak against the orange and, right, and orange and white linoleum of this life sciences building on the east end of campus. The university is old, and some of the original buildings are really pretty, all brick and dark wood and pillars. The east end of the grounds, though, was built sometime in the 60s, and I'm pretty sure that was the last time anyone's touched it. That's one of the reasons the school is so excited about having mom on the faculty. She's a chemist, but not just any chemist. She's written a couple of papers on some experiment she did that got published in some hoity-toity journals, and now people know that Luann Roth is super smart. Smart scientists mean more student enrollment, which means the school will finally be able to buy some new equipment and remodel the bathrooms. Or so Dad says. Which way's the library, I ask Mom. Downstairs to the left, but Narf, I'm only going to be a minute. Meet me down there, I call over my shoulder, disappearing down the stairs and around the dark hallway before she can tell me no. The science library is smaller than most elementary school libraries, which makes it easy to find the periodical section. Most of the tables are piled high with neatly stacked journals, worn well with sticky, cover, sticky covers and dog pay, dog-eared pages. Those aren't going to help me, though. I keep scanning the periodical staff until finally, in the very bottom corner, I spy a pile of old newspapers. The mass head on one I recognize from the sign in the building where Dad works, the Raven Brooks Banner. I sit on the ground and pull the stack onto my lap, skimming through the headlines as quickly as I can for anything with the words golden or apple. I'm a third of the way through the stack when I hear my mom's footsteps echoing through the hall above. I recognize my mom's urgent stride. Even when she's not in a hurry, she moves fast. Come on, I mutter, flipping, through, flipping faster through the pile, but nothing's jumping out at me. I skip to the bottom of the stack, but in my hurry, I fumble the papers and send the collection scattering. Narf, are you making a mess down there? 
I hear my mom's footsteps begin to descend the stairs. Ready to admit defeat, I start scooping the stack back together when I spy a paper with bold letters spelling out the headline. I grab the paper and try to skim what I can, but mom's almost at the bottom of the stairs. So I commit a mortal sin. Aliens, forgive me. Tearing the newsprint, I pull the page from the paper and shove it into my pocket before my mom pokes her head around the corner. What are you trying to do over here? Build a nest? Mom asks, her hands massaging the back of her net. neck. I didn't tear anything. I am, without a doubt, the, word, the world's worst criminal. Mom knows it, too. She shakes her head at me and then helps me clean up my mess before we leave the library, mostly the way we found it. At home, I wait until I can hear my parents snoring before pulling the article out of my pocket. On this day exactly one year ago, life for the Yee family changed forever and the town of Ravenbrooks lost a piece of its heart. What should have been a day of family fun at the newly opened Golden Apple Amusement Park turned to unimaginable tragedy when a mechanical flaw in the park's much buzzed about rotten core roller coaster caused a death of seven-year-old Lucy E. A close-up picture of a smiling girl stares back at me from the page, her eyes sparkling under a fringe of dark bangs. I read the caption reluctantly. Lucy Yee was a first grader at Raven Brooks Elementary School. She was a first grader, I think to myself. Was because she's dead now. Is that the something Aaron wanted me to guess? How could I have ever guessed something that horrific that had happened right there in the same park where we were standing earlier tonight? I keep reading the story. It was so shocking. I mean, an amusement park is supposed to be a carefree place, says Trina Bell, a former Golden Apple assembly line worker at the factory a mile from the park. I'll tell you this, no kid of mine is going to set foot on one of those contractions ever again. This just goes to show you never really know what's safe, says Bill Markson as he sweeps the sidewalk in front of the pup and puss pet supply. You know what I think? I think they rushed to open before they had all those safety tests they should have had done. Yet not all of Raven Brooks blames the Golden Apple Corporation or the builders responsible for its construction. Gladys Ewing tries to hold on to the happy memories despite the long shadow cast by the confectioner maker's meteor mm, meteoric fall from popularity. I will never forget riding the Ferris wheel with my youngest son on opening day. I've never seen him smile that big. People ought to be ashamed of burning that place down like they did. I read Gladys Ewing's quote three more times to make sure I read it right. They burned it down? I breathe. In a week dominated by suffering for a family and reflection on the further tragedy that could have struck, angry parents and townspeople gathered at the shuttered Golden Apple Amusement Park to grieve together. But what was meant to be a candlelit vigil turned riot riotous when several disgruntled citizens turned their anger towards the park. By then, blame for young Lucy Yee's death had fallen to the Golden Apple Corporation and the amusement park's lead. I flipped the page over, but all I find are stories on the neighboring town zoo and a sale on organic chickens and a natural grocer. When they were still selling meat, I suppose. I turn back to the article and see that the story continues on page B3. I lay the crumpled newsprint at my feet and lean against the bed, my head all the way back as I stare up at the ceiling. So that's what Aaron couldn't find a way to tell me. Not something I can blame him about. How do you bring up something that awful in conversation? As awful as the history of that place is, that isn't what's eating at me either. What I can't figure out is why Aaron brought me there in the first place. He obviously wanted me to know what happened there, but why? I fall asleep with thoughts of Aaron and his family whirling around in my brain. Miss Peterson's trembling hands as she puffed away on a cigarette by the window. The look she exchanged with Aaron when his dad talked about moving bones. The way Maya's face lost all of her color right before her dad picked her up and tickled her ribs. That night, I dream of small, fragile skeletons crouched low to the ashy sky bounding around by a darkened ferris wheel that's being slowly choked to death by vines. All right, that was chapter four. It was kind of a long one. Here's a picture I forgot to show you guys of the, um, of the newspaper that he's reading of Lucy, poor Lucy. 
All right, so today Aaron took him to a deserted factory and a, an amusement park where a child died about a year previously to whenever that article had been written. So I wonder what the deal is. I wonder why Aaron wanted Nikki to know all that and why he didn't just bring it up. All right, well, thanks for tuning in today. This has been chapter four of Hello Neighbor, Missing Pieces. I hope you guys enjoyed it and tune in tomorrow for chapter five. All right, miss you guys. Can't wait to see you back in the library again.